and welcome to another episode of Classical Stuff You Should Know. This is Thomas Magby, and I am joined today, as always, by Mr. Graham Donaldson. Hey, hey. And Mr. A.J. Hannenberg. That's me. <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, so I have no... <laughs> Good job, everybody. <laughs> yeah. You got your You names. knew your name. Three for three. Yay. <laughs> this is better than our last podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, it's, uh, today, uh, Mr. Graham Donaldson, I believe you have a topic for us. That's right, guys. Because you clicked on the link, you know <laughs> that today we are talking about the trivia. Woo! But the other way that we could, the other thing that Which we. Which sounds like a really nice IPA. It does, the trivium. trivium. Yeah. yeah. Right? Like three different kinds of hops. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> did we just we, did we just invent a I think beer? We, just invented do we have one. to start a brewery? Yeah, is that what, a secret it's clandestine bonding. brewery on the new campus of our Ooh. school. Um, <laughs> and this will not make. And it that was it. classical stuff you should know. Thanks, no, everybody. <laughs> anyway, bye. Uh, the trivium. Uh, the other way, the other thing we could title this podcast could be "What is classical education?" Good. So we've had a podcast called "What is classical," which was great. Which probably should have been our first podcast. All right, so this is kind of a bummer because my next one was also kind of going to be what is classical this is fu- I mean, this is classical stuff together. you should know. So essentially we're just saying the same kinds of things over and over again. Um, Do, I mean, listeners, we have new content <laughs> every, every week. week. <laughs> it's all different. Um, but the trivium. So the trivium was essentially, there, there's sort of two things uh, that I, two ways that I want to talk about the trivium today. And one is it's the way that you learn subjects and the other way that we can talk about the trivium is it's the way that our souls grow up and mm-hmm. we go from kids to adults. Um, so very uh, quickly, the trivium were the, the, the three subjects. Uh, I shouldn't even call them subjects because that's not a very classical understanding of it. But it was sort of these, the, the three ways of learning something. And uh, the three legs of the trivium, if you want to think about it as a stool, are grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Um, those are the, the the three things that you learn, and then in the middle in the Middle Ages, well, in in antiquity, and then in the in the Middle Ages, uh, there was something called the quadrivium, which was added to the trivium, and so then you had these seven liberal arts, and the quadrivium was, if I can remember, it was music, arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy. So if you were a kid going to school, you would be taught seven things and seven things only. Grammar, logic, rhetoric, music, astro- ath- uh, music, arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy. And this would be how you break things up. Now, nowadays, we break our school into English, history, APU, physics. Uh, what other classes do we have? Latin, um, Spanish. Uh, what other classes do we teach? Logic. We have a logic class. Yep. What else we got? That's all of them. And then we got all our, our wacky electives. Uh, that investing. we have our investing and like, uh, rock climbing and we had a cooking class for a long time. And one uh, last year our cooking teacher was Italian and he had like not perfect English. Um, and But he was teaching cooking and the students were – so they had to like learn the language of cooking. It was actually kind of cool. He, he, by the way, was, he was the amazing. coolest guy. He was the coolest yeah. dude ever Seriously. on the history of the planet. Yep. He was an uh, expert sailor. It made me want to learn – Italian just to talk to him because he worked he used to work in the yacht industry yep. and so the in hospitality Italy. In, in Italy and so he Michelangelo had the nicest name. handshake yeah. and he was always polite and kind and knew about food and yachting and, and he was weather worn he like he, that, that man oh, yeah. had been in the sea anyway um, can, can I ask a question about yes you can so the trivium and quadrivium they were actually separate subjects so so I, would I don't know oh. enough to know if you went from like I, I know that they didn't have like bells like and you were shuffled like, from grammar class to logic class to rhetoric class but it was uh, so I don't know enough about how it would actually work um, but these were from what I understand like yes astronomy would be different than geometry you wouldn't um, um, I think the way they probably would have done it is that it was more single teacher centric. So mm-hmm. you would study under a specific mm-hmm. tutor, um, sometimes for different topics. Like you would get a person to teach you rhetoric. Rhetoricians were especially their own kind of thing. Yeah. But if you went and studied at an academy, often it was the same. Like you studied under this guy and he would do a thing and that was the deal. But uh, in many ways, all of these My things are interconnected. Yes. Um, so I've, I've read old authors talking about the quadrivium saying things like arithmetic is, sorry, music is arithmetic in the air. So what music is, is it's math that you can hear. Hmm. And what geometry is, 
is it's music in the numbers. Yeah, no, no. It's and geometry is like is like music in in structure in space. Okay, and, and then um, astronomy. Astronomy. It's just music. Well, in space. there was an old. So here there was an old Latin phrase that was used to talk about the trivium and quadrivium. And I won't read the Latin because I'm not a I'm not a Latin scholar and I have poor Latin. Um, but it translates to this. It was this little idiom or this little thing that kids would learn, and it would go um, grammar talks. Logic teaches, sorry, logic teaches words, rhetoric colors words, music sings, arithmetic numbers, geometry weighs, astronomy tends the stars. Hmm. So this would be the, this little thing, and I'm assuming they would teach it to kids and they would learn on a little song. And these were supposed to be the seven things that they learned in education. But today we're just going to talk about the trivium, the three. And so grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And I think the best way to under to talk about how grammar, logic, and rhetoric works is to say um, that it is the three elements that you need when you are learning anything. When you are learning a subject, there is a grammar to that subject, there is a logic to that subject, and there is a rhetoric to that subject. So maybe we, I'll, I'll give you the, the example that I use a lot, which is English class, because I'm an English teacher. So grammar of English class, well, grammar is is literally the skill of speech. It is like... Syntax, etymology, it prosody. It is literally the grammar. It is literally the grammar. <laughs> grammar um, is the grammar. The grammar. Yeah. It is the grammar. But it's also, um, yeah, we can talk. So grammar is also um, like background information. So history is entirely, is uh, so the subject of history is more relegated to the study of grammar. Mm. So I, my understanding is in old schools or in old um, classes, when you were doing grammar things, you were also learning history. Mm. History was um, was was, was uh, um, considered grammar. It was the things that you needed to know in order to move on. Um, uh, anyway, so if you have the grammar of an English class, so that is, let's say we're doing a book. Let's say we're doing. Um, uh, Brave New World. So, oh, it's not too Brave New World. That's so, such a bummer of a book. Oh, let's do Paradise Lost. So if you're doing the grammar of Paradise Lost, it is the plot. Mm-hmm. It is the actual things that happen in the book. What happened when? Who are the main characters? What happened when? Who are the main characters? Who's Abdiel? Answer, he's the best. Yes, exactly. <laughs> who's Abdiel? Who's Satan? Uh, um, who did God make in the garden? It's the types of things that you populate a reading quiz over. These are the grammar level uh, questions. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you then, quiz on them so you don't have to spend that much time on them in exactly. class in I mean, high school. And so you, you quiz on them because you want the students coming to your class having Prepared. the grammar mm-hmm. yeah. understanding of it yeah. so that you can talk about the other things. Now, the logic is, um, as a subject, the logic is just how to talk sense. So when we, if you listen to the old podcasts on the um, logical fallacies, we were talking about how to talk nonsense or how to <laughs> how to not talk sense or how to untangle nonsense in order to talk sense you need logic in order to do that it's a it's a skill yep. um, so proving and disproving um it's making connections it's figuring yeah. out how things interact with each other that's right so you, not just that abdiel did this but why he did this and what mm. were the effects afterwards what so when you when you have a question where you say why does satan decide to rebel against god prove your point or give me evidence. Mm-hmm. That's a logic-based question. So the grammar, they need to know that Satan did rebel against God, and they need to know all of the, the, the things in the book that could be used to derive an argument. And so then you say, why did he do it? And then if they're writing an essay or they're writing a paragraph on why Satan did it, then they are making, they're talking about the logic of literature. And a lot of English academics talk about the logic of literature. Yeah. You're almost... Uh, a big chunk of our essays are proving things from the story. So, um, the, so mm-hmm. the grammar you said is you'll test that when they get to class to make sure they actually did the reading. Yep. Is logic then uh, in a conversation? Like, will you So talk logic, logic would be in a conversation, and then... Um, you hope that they pick up some of it. By yes. the time they're in high school, I mean, th- these these three stages also correspond with brain development. When we'll, you are, we'll, we'll get there. Okay, sorry. I didn't mean to jump the gun here. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so you you want them to... Kids will usually come in and they will have opinions as to why Satan did something or they're starting to synthesize and they're starting to put these ideas together. Yeah, and so right. synthesis is a, is a logical thing. Um, so they're, it's, it's concerned with proving. That's what logic is. Yeah. Um, and then rhetoric is um, – the, the actual study of rhetoric as its own subject is, is mainly um, relegated to like structure and style and it's a very practical art. Um, it's, it's how to color words. 
And so let's just talk, we'll talk about rhetoric as its own subject in a second, but in terms of, of learning a subject, rhetoric then comes down to how you, what you do with this information. So if we think about these three questions, grammar is what happened, logic is why did it happen, and then rhetoric is should it have happened, right? And then this is when you start making these, um, uh, where the student now needs to start making judgments about whether or not what the character did was a good idea or a bad idea. If they were in that situation, what would they have done? Would they have done something differently? So for example, this past week we were doing Romeo and Juliet, and I, uh, we asked the question, why did Friar Lawrence do this crazy plan where he gave Juliet the potion? Uh, and they said, well, he's under stress, and she was wanting to kill herself, and they didn't have a whole lot of time, and he loves potions because he's a potion dude, and this is like potions is his thing, so why not give a plan based on something that you love? Uh, which are all great answers. And then the rhetoric style question is, was this a good idea? Should he have done this? And everyone's like, no, this is a bad <laughs> idea. Why don't you go find Juliet a horse and have her run away? Um, why don't you sit down like a man and talk to the families and, you know, actually work through this conflict without bloodshed? Um, Can we make a correction? Why not find Juliet a hair? A hair? Horse? Like, hair? Same the French confusion from French. the last podcast. Nobody, oh, for crying out loud. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, remember the, you remember the time you made a mistake on this podcast? I do remember okay, the time. Good. <laughs> yes, my one mistake. <laughs> That's right. So we can find Juliet um, something to escape on. It was like a giant rabbit. A gi- yeah. Um, yeah, I was worried about that before I told the joke. I was like, it could, be t- could, could go two ways. Yeah. Um, and so then, so those are the types, those are rhetoric questions. Should they have done this? Um, was this a good idea? Uh, and then ultimately, what, how do we live in light of the story that we've read is kind of the direction that we want English class to take. And then the assessments on these kinds of questions are a little bit more difficult because um, it's a lot harder if a student says something, you know, absolutely terrible, like Father Lawrence should have just ignored everybody and like did his job and not cared about people. And you're like, well... You want people, you know, like, like pastors should care about people. Um, those are th- those are always the kinds of questions I don't really know how to answer in class when someone says something that is like kind of terrible. <laughs> um, so, so would that be a failing of logic? Uh, um, no, no, because they're making a logical. So it is logical. It's just not. It's just it's just not moral. Uh, I don't know if if re- rhetoric uh, is in the realm of of ethics. Uh, maybe it is. Um, but anyway, but for the point of the trivium, this is these are the sort of the three um, stages. And as far as I understand, and I, and I think this plays itself out, that there is a grammar and a logic and a rhetoric to any kind of skill that you have. So we talk a lot about pottery on this podcast because Hannenberg's a, uh, a potter. And so I have never <laughs> potted, um, but I assume that there's a grammar for pottery. You need to know the wheel and you need to know how these things work and the different densities of clay and the different, how much moisture needs to go into it and everything. And the actual skills that you do with your hand, there's the logic of it, how firing actually works. What is happening to the clay if I put it into the, the kiln at this temperature, if I add this element to it, what kind of color am I going to get? You need to know the whys of how these things happen. And then Hannenberg, what would be like the rhetoric of pottery? The rhetoric would be using that knowledge you have to do complex things with the glazes and with the clay to achieve effects that are unexpected, I think. So to take take my knowledge that this creates a blue and this creates a green and use those glazes in a surprising way or totally transform the, the medium into something else. Make the clay look like fabric, which ends up in really impressive pieces. Mm. Or maybe use it to express... I I think this is where most artists go, is using that medium to express something else about human life, where I could take the clay and use all of that knowledge that I have to say something about humanity, to say something about how the earth, as in clay, connects to us as people. And then you're moving beyond just the medium of the thing, and you're talking about uh, the sort of connected whole. And that's... And and so... um, one of the things in, in classical education is that once you get to this sort of rhetoric level, you start talking about everything else. You start talking mm-hmm. about the whole. Um, um, and so this is, um, yeah, we, we've addressed this in an earlier podcast about how the, f- the further up the ladder you go, um, really you, st- you get closer and closer to... Um, uh, Just talking to, about the same thing. To, no, no, no. You get closer and closer to he who made everything. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, just sorry. When you say the whole, are you talking about like 
similarities between subjects or I don't know. I'm just trying to think it's like, maybe this is, this is kind of what AJ was just, his answer that he just threw out is that there's a, a sameness to all these things. Mm-hmm. Are you saying that that sameness is the creator of all of these things? Y- yes. Um, well, and this kind of goes back to maybe this is what, just to go back to last week's podcast of what Peeper was talking about when he says, the more that you get into a leisure of the thing, he said that what you're doing is philosophy and we kind of yep. took issue with that. But maybe this is what he's getting at, that you're starting to contemplate how something fits into creation. Hmm. I, I love thinking about this in terms of the uh, the medieval universe, which we've had, we talked about in earlier podcasts, where uh, the higher up you go, the more that you get you get closer to God who has created everything and the sort of slower, like if everything is revolving, the slower it gets, right? Like if you get closer to the center of a wheel, the less motion you find. When you get to the rhetoric of a subject, you begin to understand it in relationship to its to other things, and then uh, re- and then sort of relationship uh, uh, to its source uh, of who made it. Um, so there's there's like a jump that you know when AJ said yeah the, the, the difference between knowing what glazes is going to happen to asking questions or talking about how this is from the earth and how it relates to man and if this mug or this cup can now be saying something about our relationship to creation then you've jumped into a rhetoric understanding of it and yes it can get a little like I think we we intuitively get a little. Uh, eye rolly with this because it's done so poorly in the art, it's modern a vessel arts. vessel and we're vessels. Yeah, <laughs> like exactly. Kind of um, but when it actually has a strong uh, backing to it, I, it can be quite profound. Um, so is that so? The higher up you go in the cosmology, mm-hmm. it's the first whatever. I have not used that word in a long time. There's less motion, so mm-hmm. there's less change as you go up because yeah. it's already perfect and it doesn't need to change. Yeah, is the prima, that prima mobile doesn't spin. Mm-hmm. So is that is that why we? The trivium is from the Middle Ages. It's an old thing, and it still has relevance to us today. Like, mm-hmm. does it, does that point to it being a higher thing? In that there is, we we can take a method from five hundred years ago and still use that, and it still be relevant. Like, I or think, with rhetoric that you you can the sophists were persuasive people. Their means of persuasion we can still use today, and they're still effective. Like, does that point, or is this a logical fallacy that? Have we gotten to something higher when we find something that has lasted a long time? And I think works? it's just more that you found it, something true. I think that. That's an easy place to go. Is that it's a true thing, but we have also held on to things that are not true for a very, very, very long time. I, if if we're talking age and five hundred years is the is the credibility factor for it, then you know the Mesopotamian view of the world as a flat disc with mountains, and after that we're the gods. Back of a turtle. Do we not? Wait, we don't believe that. Yeah. Oh no. So we could, you know, just because something lasts a long time, I think, I think what we should do is raise the question: Okay, why has it lasted? Is it because we haven't? evaluated it? Is it because it has been evaluated and found functional or is it because it is actually true, right? Things are, can be functional for a very long time with while yet being totally untrue mm-hmm. and things can be evaluated and not found wanting when really we're, our evaluation is poor. So, but, but I think sometimes things do last because they are true. And if that's the case, then yeah, we're reaching towards something that is eternal and unchanging. Which I think is the attempt of what we're doing with the trivium mm-hmm. of trying to that this is a method that can be applied to literally anything. It's a it's a tool. It is not unique to just one subject. It's a methodology, right? Yes, so yes, there is yes. there's a grammar logic rhetoric to um, to uh, uh, pottery. There's a grammar logic rhetoric to English class. There's a grammar logic rhetoric to reading the Bible, which we talk about with in hermeneutics. There's a grammar logic rhetoric to everything: dancing, um, fencing, any sort of these anything that you can learn has a grammar and logic and a rhetoric to. And then, sort of coincidentally, maybe not coincidentally. There's also a grammar, logic, and rhetoric of the human person. Right. And so if you're in classical education or spend any time in, cl- in the classical education world, you will notice that schools are broken into a grammar school, a logic school, and a rhetoric school. And it's not just that these things that you're only teaching grammar in grammar school, and you're only teaching logic in logic school, and you're only teaching rhetoric in rhetoric school. It's that there is this... I guess we would call it a theory, but there is this observation that the human person goes through stages as they grow. So babies and little kids are in the grammar stage. And the grammar stage means that they are learning how, what is. They are learning what is out there. They are learning um, – uh, uh, they're sort of collecting everything and, and putting it into a giant bucket. They have not ordered their giant bucket, um, but they just have everything in their giant bucket. 
And so this is why little kids love looking for patterns and they love looking for things that are going to change or going to stay the same. And just memorizing facts. facts. And memorizing facts. Did you know that a shark has 3,000 teeth? I did not know that. They can sing songs. They memorize facts. And we sort of go, oh, gosh, that sounds terrible. But little kids, it just is working in the grain of their soul. They love they love memorizing things and they can do it very easily. Um, we all know those stories about, or though we hear those things where, uh, once you're 14, it's, it's a lot harder to learn a language, you know, it's cause it's a lot of, it's a lot of memorization. And so it's easier for a kid. So when a little, when a little kid says, can you read me the story again? Can you read me the story again? It's because their souls are in the grammar stage They're They are wanting to know what changes and what stays the same. Um, what uh, is the ending of the story going to be the same ending as it was before? Um, um, they, they're and trying they rejoice to... in just knowing that that's true. Exactly. Like, I know the ending and there it is again and that feels so good. It feels so good. And little kids, they don't have a concept of time, but they'll realize, wait a minute, Christmas happens. When is it happening again? And then they'll come to you in July and they'll say, is it, is it Christmas yet? <laughs> And you'll be like, no, it's July. And they'll be like, okay, because I know there is a Christmas, <laughs> but I don't know when this Christmas is happening. Yeah. And I know that it should be happening because I remember it from before, but I've only had three of them <laughs> that I can remember. So, like, help me out here. When is Christmas happening? You know, so this is, this is a grammar stage type of thing. Um, and so students are a lot of fun in this stage because they love school and they want to learn things and they, can, and they, they absorb things. And we teach them – uh, and so the good the good school or the good uh, grammar teacher will teach them things that maybe they don't necessarily understand, but in the future mm-hmm. they will order and then they will be able to use because they have them memorized. So like we teach all of the, the grammar stage kids all the prepositions in a little preposition song, which I don't know, and I rumor has it Hannenberg knows. I, I have them memorized using Memory Palace, not using mm-hmm. the oh. song. So that Memory Palace should be a podcast in the future for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hannenberg, what are the prepositions? <laughs> about above across before after for against of off on on to at along inside outside over under amid among throughout with within without from to through beyond but behind beneath underneath during concerning like by since past until upon between and to around atop near below toward except and regarding beside and that's just – so AJ does not have notes in front of him that I just sprung that on him. And he doesn't just have that rote memory. I'm sure that if I asked him to do it backwards, he probably could because of the memory palace. I can, do, you, do you want me to? I want to see if you can try. Yeah. So do you want it – okay. It's beside, regarding, except, toward, atop, around, into, between, upon – until, past, since, by, like, concerning, during, underneath, beneath, behind, but, beyond, through, to, from, without, within, with, throughout, among, amid, under, over, outside, inside, along, at, onto, on, off of against for after before above about that's oh wait across above about that's just that's impressive that's really impressive no seriously that is amazing to um, be fair, we weren't checking them we, we were not it. checking yeah, them so yeah. He, yeah so at home please check Could go you, back <laughs> rewind email, send us that's emails. can we just get rid of that no no like that's, that's happening that's amazing this is a fascinating uh, podcast so yeah. no yeah, we're gonna go back reciting the prepositions this <laughs> no, no, is not fascinating we is, have to get rid no, of this that is absolutely fascinating because it's gonna because people who hear that are gonna say oh my goodness how did Hanberg do that and then it's memory palace and we're gonna teach that later but anyway so little kids they love memorizing these things because they're souls are in the stage where where grammar is lovely Uh, (laughs) but then kids grow up and they move into the logic stage and you know a child has moved into the logic stage when they start asking that dreaded question why (laughs) when they start saying why is the sky blue why does a squirrel store the nuts for winter how does a squirrel know how to do it um, and at some point, parents are like, yeah, just be quiet, they're please. Like, <laughs> just stop just asking stop questions. Stop asking annoying questions. Sit in the back. So that's why Cheerios. the logic stage is just the, best, <laughs> the, the worst. worst. Oh. <laughs> no, you have to be a special person to, uh, to teach in the logic school. And I, yeah. it is my strong belief that 
our logic school teachers at Veritas are the best. Most patient. The most patient, just wonderful <laughs> teachers. Grammar school. I mean, sorry, r- rhetoric school. We get like more finished products mm. and we get like these kids that are interesting and love things. And it's because of those because, hard logic yeah. years. It's, good. it's true. One of my favorite logic moments, it was from when the school met back on a completely different, it was several years ago. And it was, you know, they're trying to figure out why things happen and when things happen. And one kid goes, I heard this, I overheard this as they were walking into a classroom. One kid goes, you can't get a virus from a starfish. And the other, <laughs> the other kid goes, you can if you eat it. And then they walked in. I was like, they're the just best. trying to, they're just trying just to trying figure to out why out. things happen. They're just happen. trying to figure out that's logic. Yeah. So the logical stage is wanting to know. So they have all this, they've got this basket of things mm-hmm. and they want to know how all of these things fit together. And so the good school or the good logic teacher gives them tools of organization and gives them the ability to synthesize and to dissect and to, to pull apart and to push together and to organize. And so genus, uh, uh, species, kingdom, class, order, family, all of these sorts of schools seem maybe a little boring uh, to some, but to the logic age kid, it gives them a sense of, of order and structure for the world and they can start and they will actually go through the task of like putting these things together. And there's also that little sort of diabolic joy they have of be of like proving their right. teacher wrong or like or or um, come, showing why something is. And if the teacher so this is why in the logic stage, they glory in correcting. Right, they will. They glory in correcting somebody if they've made if they've done something wrong. And if you know a thirteen-year-old girl, you know this is true. Um, another way to think of the logic stage is the well, actually stage. Well, actually, <laughs> it's like this. Well, actually, in my the book that I read said that Napoleon did it because of this. Well, and then it gets annoying, which is why you need to have character patience. training as well and patience. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's not that they're just. Um, precocious jerks um they are it's going through a a necessary stage of the soul and that is this logical stage which is how to talk sense and to prove and disprove and it is it is essentially a combative stage Mm -hmm. and it just is um um it's a it's a it's a hard time of life of growing up because it it is it it is a fight yeah they're not only learning the logic of the subjects they're studying but also of just basic social interaction the logic of humans the logic of hearts yeah what jokes land how what sorts of things you can say to people and have them still be your friends tomorrow and this is why middle school is generally the worst for everyone yeah you know i it's a rare person you may meet who Who is like like, yeah i had a pretty good time like i've i've met i think (laughs) one in my lifetime it was horrible for almost everyone because that kid was homeschooled yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) or they were pretty yeah (laughs) pretty kids Um, anyway so if so there's Mm -hmm. a so there's a grammar logic rhetoric for the student and there's a grammar logic rhetoric for the subject Mm -hmm. so if there's a logic student taking uh math yeah do they only go up to the logic stage? Not uh, so. Like is that is that is that how much I don't know for? enough about math to know. Or there, there's got to be. Oh, well, there's rhetoric. certainly a rhetoric. There's of math. a rhetoric it's of math. architecture. No, no, I agree that there is. I'm asking in the logic stage no. of the student. So um, you don't first just school, stay we split there. it up first, uh, first through fourth, and then fifth through eighth, and then ninth through twelfth. So in fifth through eighth of math, would you teach them a rhetoric level of math, or are they not ready for that? No, um, no, they're not ready for that. You can do some sort of ex- um, so. Y- the trouble with grouping students together by age, which is kind of like an arbitrary thing, we're kind of making them like we make cars. Um, the you know the, t- the twenty seventeen model rolling off. We the, expect them all to be. We expect the same. them all. Whereas the the experience tends to be that girls enter the logic stage much sooner than boys, and so you have these twelve year old girls who are definitely in the logic stage, and you've got these twelve year old boys who are maybe still in the grammar stage. Mm-hmm. Um, I know lots about rocks. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I love flipping dinosaurs. Um, and then the girls like you don't knock it. It sounds um, great. The dinosaurs are pretty yeah, well, cool. Yeah, and then and then the girls, you know, they're having their their logic of love conversations and all these sorts of and how they can like like each other and hate each other and these kinds of things yeah anyway <laughs> and um, boys are still like you like dinosaurs too <laughs> yeah. um so yes you you can have you need to have grammar at all stages so if you're coming in and you're learning algebra and you don't learn algebra in third grade mm. and if you're learning algebra there's a grammar to it you need to learn that yeah. when you come to shakespeare there's a gr- in high school there's a grammar to it you need to know iambic pentameter um but you just um you you hope that the grammar and the logic has been developed well enough that those can go by relatively quickly in the rhetoric stage. So in the logic stage, um, the logic stage is always really tricky because there are some who are transitioning from grammar to logic 
at a certain age, and there are some who are transitioning from logic to rhetoric at a certain age, sure. and oftentimes they're sort of all in it together. Um, and then, um, then there's the various subjects. There could be a student that really is into the logic of stories, but just is still in the grammar of science. Or there's a student that's pushing into the rhetoric of math yeah. and is still really in the grammar, the grammar of, of literature. So, um, but generally speaking, the logic stage is that stage where you're saying the whys and you're concerned with proving and disproving and ordering. And then the rhetoric stage is the final stage, and it's the stage that you're in for the rest of your life. So uh, me, you guys, we're in the rhetoric stage, and the high school student is moving from the logic stage to the rhetoric stage. So when they, so Hannenberg in ninth grade will see some kids that are still really in that younger seventh, eighth grade logic stage headspace, and then some that are really moving into asking questions about like, who am I, and what do I do, and what is important, and why is life worth living, and is... Um, is what you know what Hamlet's saying about uh, uh, should I do my duty to my family or should I go and live the life that I want to live? Like, what would I do in that mm-hmm. situation? And and those are the rhetoric based questions. And then because um, those are the things that they're going to be thinking about for the rest of their lives. So you tailor the school and the learning day to cater to that kind of of learning. So they get real bored in English class if you spend the whole time just saying why did Friar Lawrence do this. And they can answer the question, but if you never move into should he have done it was a good idea, what we, what should have happened, um, what can we learn? And then, um, um, so one question that I that I ask in Romeo and Juliet is I give them a quote from Seneca, and he says, um, "The happy soul is the one that can escape from what was it fear and desire by use of reason." <laughs> so a quote from Seneca, and so then I can ask the question. All right, based on that quote. The happy man is one who can escape fear and desire by use of reason. Is there anybody in Romeo and Juliet who's happy? So there's so that's kind of more of a rhetoric style question because but you need you need the other two to make those exactly questions. like the kids mm-hmm. that come to class having not read or not understanding why things happened they can't mm-hmm. answer should Friar Lawrence yeah. have done this because they don't know why he did it or what effects came of it or they don't they don't understand the basic level of stuff and these three things grammar and logic happen every time you learn a new subject yes. so yeah. be, even though I'm in the rhetoric stage. I still have to, every time I get a new piece of software, I have to be like, what does this button do? That's the (laughs) Mm -hmm, grammar. And then what sorts of effects can I get when I do these things and how do they all link together? That's the logic. And then rhetoric is when I actually use it to create something. And then you can be sort of mastering it. Um, Can I I ask another question? Um, So you you were talking about um, there are differences when people get to those levels individually. Mm -hmm. So, um, So whereas our schools would separate between fourth and fifth grade as the difference between grammar and logic, some students will get will be ready for logic sooner than others or later than others. Do you, are those just individual differences? Or this is probably a question more for AJ. So if someone comes into your class and they are only ready to have a logic conversation, even though they've entered the school of rhetoric, do you just look at that and say, they'll come around eventually? Or is there no moral component to this? Does it like, is it, is it all just a, they'll get there someday? Typically it's a, that they'll get there really? someday. Okay. I mean, I, it depends on the class, right? There are sometimes in English class where, a kid will raise his hand and he'll, you know, I'll ask a, should they have done this? And he'll say, he did it and it got this effect. And they're, they're still logic. in logic stage, right? Yeah. They're putting together connections and can't go to a, they can't go to that higher level que- question yet. But, and that's just a question of ability and brain stage, right? Yeah. But there are some classes where, and this is typically, I find this in leadership classes where mm. we're discussing levels, you know, questions of morality and questions of spirituality and what should the man do and what is man. And there are some people who, are eager to ask and answer these questions and have been struggling with them yeah. since seventh grade. And there are some kids who are like, does this affect football or mm-hmm. video games? I don't care. Right. Yeah. It's, and in that case, it's, it's not so much a question of ability so much as they just waking don't, them up. Yeah. Like, they just like don't care about the question yet. And so them. I have to, so sometimes I, I endeavor to, sh- you know, ask them a question that will make them think about it. Or yeah. I just think, you know what, they're in ninth grade. Sometimes they don't think about this until 10th and mm-hmm. that's, and yeah, that's okay. And I think to my own experience, like a lot of these things, um, uh, didn't really have much currency for me until even college. Like when I was doing undergrad philosophy and, uh, I remember, I remember having a lecture where the professor was talking about Plato and it was asking rhetoric style questions. And I was so interested in the question and 
they sort of said, and then, you know, to answer this sort of thing, you need to go read book three. And I went and I looked at book three and it was incomprehensible to mm. me because of the level of reading that it required. Yeah. And I can distinctly remember sitting at the Victoria College Library on the University of Toronto campus for like four and a half straight hours sitting there and going slowly word by word with mm. dictionary and like writing down like what does ontology mean and like looking it up and what does all of this mean because I wanted to know the answer and I didn't have the grammar for it. And I was so I'd like plowed through the grammar and the logic so I could get to the rhetoric. And then then all of a sudden, like that's when education for me opened up. So yeah. and so it happens to different kids at different stages. Mm-hmm. And that so on the one hand, some people say, well, we shouldn't have a school based on on the, on arbitrary separation of age. We should sort of have like these tests of stages and they can sort of jump up. But there is something good about the social pressure to um, make the kid. Move from logic, move from to, logic rhetoric. to rhetoric because they're they're sitting around everybody else that are asking these big questions and if they're being derpy derps still thinking about childish things there is a good social pressure that is that is put on them that sort of causes them to have to dig deeper to to grow. Yeah. Um, and, and I would and there's some arbitrariness in that not everyone gets there at the same point but it is it is based on the development of your brain that um, your brainstem that just kind of like the automatic responses um, you you will have very strong from the beginning your cortex which is where the I'm pointing to all these things as if other people can see them, but it's just AJ. Yeah, he's holding his head. Literally holding two my hands. Head. So the the, <laughs> cor- the cortex builds out next, and that's where your logical thinking occurs. And hands pre- are on top of head, and then prefrontal cortex, kind of where unicorn horn goes. Hands are on front of head. Yep, uh, is is kind of is the sign of maturity, the sign of adulthood, the ability to have a thought and not necessarily do that thing. That's the prefrontal cortex. So it matches brain development, but while there are averages of when people build out different parts. Obviously, not everyone meets that average exactly. I don't. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say it's completely arbitrary. Yeah. No. So it's it's um, it's, so in many ways, so that's sort of the way that we organize schools classically yep. is grammar, logic, and rhetoric. But if you went back and you did some studies on like the medieval university, yeah. they do have courses on grammar, logic, rhetoric, arithmetic, um, math, arithmetic, and what were the other ones? Music, geometry, geometry and astronomy, yep. and so. We shouldn't confuse the two things. So like what you would study if you studied grammar in a medieval college or a medieval university, if you went to Cambridge and you studied grammar, it would be speech, but it would also be things like the explanation of, of illusions, literary illusions, rhetorical device or literary devices and how to understand them. History would be in grammar. Um, logic is, of course, um, actual logic, like logical syllogisms and that thing. And rhetoric is the biggest distinction. So the way we've been talking about rhetoric in this podcast is kind of talking about it in terms of mastery and in terms of the stage of the human soul. But rhetoric as a subject is quite different. It's the, it's the coloring of words. It's the way that you can turn sentences to convince people of things. Um, it's where you use rhetorical uh, mores. Um, it's the study of expression. It's the so study the, way, of expression. the way I kind of mm-hmm. see it is you can kind of, like this is an easy analogy. You just sort of take things in in the grammar stage mm-hmm. And then in the logic stage, you make connections between, between. those things. Mm-hmm. And in the rhetoric stage, you take those connections and you put them back into, out into the world mm-hmm. as some sort of, you know, expression or art or argument or that sort of thing, right? Mm-hmm. You, you evaluate, you begin to express your own opinion on things because you've made the connections. Mm-hmm. So intake, process, output. Yeah. And so if then, you want to go straight computer with it. Yeah. And then if and then you can there is something I don't know enough about that I want to learn about is the various types of rhetorical mores that you can use. And I've got just sort of three examples that I looked up just to give you an understanding of what I'm talking about. So a more I would be something like um ex polito, ex um letting letting the same thing be uh disguised by a variety of forms. So if you think about the Psalms, um they talk about this. When the Psalm is talking about maybe one thing, but they're talking about it in three different ways. Mm-hmm. That's a rhetorical device. Um, or in, uh, a discursus or a digression is another rhetorical device. And or, they were actually trained in this. And, so and they were, in yeah. the medievals, they did it sometimes too much. It, they did. Where they, instead of talking about the thing itself, you, um, they would you, dance don't, it for a while. you don't call the thing by its own name. So if you're talking about virtue, you may say things like, oh, blissful light of that which becomes clear. You know, that kind of thing. That is a rhetorical <laughs> That is sort of a rhetorical kind of device. And so um, learning when to use those and when not to use those is the actual study of rhetoric. Mm -hmm. But what we're talking about is the stage of rhetoric. Yeah, but that's a how to get Mm -hmm. those connections you've made 
out into the world into mm-hmm. other people, right? So yes. if you're going to talk about one thing, this idea that you have, you think you can express it in three different ways mm-hmm. that get near to the point mm-hmm. and express it better than maybe trying to state it exactly. And AJ, you're talking about how grammar is the, is the taking in, the logic is the sort of understanding and the rhetoric is the expression. You've actually stumbled on one of my favorite metaphors for education, which is a quote by Epictetus. And he says, uh, for even sheep do not vomit up their grass and show the shepherds how much they have eaten. But when they have internally digested the pasture, they produce externally wool and milk. Mm. And this is kind of how I like to think about what I want from students. I don't want them to take things in and then go on a test and like barf it mm. and be like, look, I ate this at one point and now I've thrown it up at you. <laughs> but I want them to actually take it, understand it, digest it, and then produce something natural and good from it. Don't just barf the things that I taught you, but produce wool and milk. So produce uh, sort of the good human thing that you want uh, the soul to produce from having learned and thought about the thing that we talked about. So when we talk about love in Romeo and Juliet and maybe how wrong their love was or how foolish their love was, then we need to be talking, then the, the, the kind of thing that I want to see from the students is, can they articulate um, what the good in love ought to be. Uh, uh, and that's the wool and milk, as opposed to just to say, like, I remember this metaphor, barf. And like, even more is. importantly is they actually go out and live what they've learned in Romeo and Juliet out in the real world, right? I may, Perhaps I shouldn't have secret romances. Perhaps I should be suspicious sure. of being infatuated mm-hmm. with some things, right? That's that's the wool and the milk, right? If they, Because if they can articulate it in class, but then don't inter- mm-hmm. internalize it, it is still a little bit of their like, here's the grass and I chewed it a little bit, mm-hmm. right? They're, they're sort of making the connection that you want to hear and mm-hmm. not actually living it. But is there, so with rhetoric though, it's, it, rhetoric is the persuasion of others, isn't it? So isn't there even this kind of like next level of like, yes, they do it themselves, which maybe is more logic, but then they they live that way in such a winsome way that others want to also internalize the things that you're teaching them. I don't know. I think it's interesting that the end of grammar, logic, rhetoric is external. It's not just the person. It is. Well, I would also say that, I mean, strictly saying that rhetoric is external, I think misses a little bit how we take those things and turn it into a good life well lived. Right. I would say that the rhetoric of education is living a, a life that is full of human flourishing Right. And not just convincing other people to do it. Right. That's yes. excusing you from the burden. Yeah, I, I'm saying it's both. I'm saying yeah. it's both. I, I need to change. how. So, Graham, if you taught Romeo and Juliet and you ignored all the things you're teaching the students, but just persuaded them to do it, that would be immoral. Could I say that? Like, what it would be dis- disingenuous. Like, uh, if you teach them that you should not be so controlled by your passions that you um, make bad decisions, but then you are only motivated by the passions. And oh, not, I myself am yes. a, yeah. Um, then I'm a hack. Yes. Or, uh, yeah. Sophist. A sophist. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Um, the, the sophist is like, I, I get them to make the weaker argument, the stronger. Uh, I'm just like a bad preacher or, you know, like, like someone who, who, who preaches the, the straight and narrow and then lives the broad and crooked. Yeah. I'm just saying that there are both sides, uh, that even for the students that we want them to understand the grammar. We want them to logically understand how these pieces go together, but then we also want it to be like rhetorically persuasive. Which is why that in English class or in any sort of class, there needs to be a, not a confessional side of it, but there also needs to be a, I'm a human being too that needs to learn this. And there needs to be kind of like, you need to be able to display to students moments where you, A, actually do feel convicted about something. And then you communicate to them like, wow, I find this very convicting for this reason. And then, um, um, yeah. I, I think that's an that's an important part of it. So that's the trivium. So grammar, logic, and rhetoric. It's the way that you can understand any subject. So that, I, I think that's just a helpful tool when you're going about learning anything. Is, or teaching your kids, or, right? Mm-hmm. Asking them to express or create before they actually have yeah, the, the grammar. grammar of something. Like and saying, paint a beautiful painting. Well, I don't know how. Learn <laughs> how to use the brushes first. Learn what kind of brush strokes make what kind of effects. And the thing is, little kids, like we value creativity as adults because that's, a, you know, we, we value critical thinking and the, all these sorts of things. And often, and we see this a lot. I, I definitely saw this in school when I was in uh, you know, sort of progressive public education is we're trying to push the ends further and further down the chain and we're like demanding younger and younger grades to produce 
higher level um, things before they've developed. So we want critical thinking at, you know, grade four. Um, we want uh, uh, them to be – we want them to be expressive and creative um, by the time they're 12 when – they can't do it because they haven't learned it. And the other thing is their souls don't want to do it right. because they're not there yet. Um, we think they should want it because we're because adults we and we – because we want it. Yeah. But we forget that the five-year-old loves seeing if that butterfly's wings are a different color than this butterfly's wings. Yeah. And they want to like look at it and compare the two and be like, they're different. Yeah, this what, is incredible. What would be really tough for us if someone said, you know – I want you to take this yellow paint and use eight different brushes and see what the brushes do. Like, that wouldn't be that fun for us. Yeah. But for a kid, like, they're, you know, they're going to make eight different lines that look totally crazy, and then they're going to want to do it with another color, blue, and see if it's the same yeah. thing, right? So, yeah, so we, um, so in that sense, you sort of need to trust the system, or it, it's mm. a system that's built in line and in ingrained with the soul of the kid as as they age, which is one of the reasons why I think it works well, because, um it's tailored to that it's, student. It's tailored right? to that student. And in some levels, it should – They sh- when they're in that class that is working for the grammar, logic, and rhetoric stage, there should be a level of comfort mm. for the soul. Like I think the good logic student says like, aha, now finally we're getting to the thing I really want to talk about, which is the whys. And then in high school, you can definitely see it when I ask one of those bigger rhetor- rhetorical questions. The students be like, finally, we're talking about something that really matters. Yeah. yeah and, um, the, and I mean, they're, the basic general desire of any high school kid is I just want to express myself. Yeah, exactly. And that's rhetoric. And they that's want rhetoric. To do rhetoric. And they're doing it for the first time. And they've just been awoken to the desire to want to express themselves. And, um, and if you don't give them the tools to be able to express themselves, well, that desire will manifest itself in other ways. They'll yeah. try to express themselves some other way. The clothes and piercings and mm-hmm. that sort of thing are often just a manifestation of expression. expression because in they, a don't have, they, they don't, don't have, have the tools to be able to yeah. do it verbally or whatever. Anyway, so Grammar Logic Rhetoric. That's it, boys. There we go. That was great. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening to this episode of Classical Stuff You Should Know. Uh, check us out online, classicalstuff.net, or send us an email, classicalstuff at veritasacademy.net. Nailed it. Um, you can also find us on, find us on iTunes. And if you've been really enjoying us, I hate I hate doing self-plugs or asking for Five things, star. but reviews really oh. help us out. They get us higher on the search lists, and they can find more listeners. And, you know, there's no real reason for that. We're not making money from it, nope. but... We really believe in some of the things we talk about yeah. and that that it's a good thing for people to think about the soul of man. So if you want more people to think about, you know, what is good for people to do, then like yeah, us. Recommend give us a like us. Then like <laughs> us and give us five stars. I guess that was a weird way to ask for a five star review. But, but did we get anything wrong? I'm, I'm in sure. Past, in a few podcasts, do we need to add anything to our new segment of stuff we got wrong? Oh, let me think uh, of one. Already, already confessed my thing last time. Well, let's do it because we. I try. I think I cut you off last time. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, a few podcasts ago, when uh, AJ was talking about uh, vices, I confused uh, 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 justice with prudence. So I talked about prudence when I should have been talking about justice. So sorry about that. Do we, do we need to correct it? Yeah. What's what's what is, the, what's the articulate? The oh, sorry. Was, uh, so we're tra- now I'm going to mess it up again. So we were talking about. Um, uh, virtue as the mean between two different things. And um, what I was describing was the mean between getting uh, more than one deserves and getting less than one deserves. That mean is justice. That ah. uh, prudence is um, the is knowing when to do the right thing. So um, doing an excess of a thing or, or too little of a thing, the mean of that is prudence. So. And justice is getting what you deserve? Justice is getting what you deserve. But well, I call that prudence a few episodes. Dear ago. listener, you deserve the goodness of this podcast. <laughs> yep. So what we have done is a just thing. <laughs> Good. Uh, that, good, good it's a weird way to end. On that end. note, thank you. <laughs> From yeah, <laughs> bye. Yeah, bye.